to talk about the glory. You know, ooh, I mean, just, I want to tell you something. God likes that word. <laughs> glory. You know, sometimes, have you ever noticed how much Christianese we speak? Like, we say these things. We don't have a clue what they mean. <laughs> okay, but. We just say them. But the Lord wants to open our understanding in this regard. Isaiah 40, verse 5 says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Not might. Shall be revealed to those who fear him. The glory of the Lord may dwell in the land. Now, all flesh will see it together. So it's Isaiah 40, verse 5, and Psalms 85, verse 9. Can you imagine that? Does God want his glory to dwell in a nation? Say yes. If you don't know, just trust me. The Bible is very clear that glory is so important that it is a name of God. Like when you see a name of the Lord Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, many times people don't put this name. But listen, Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. This is so power-packed. I think you could teach it kind of phrase by phrase. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does he call himself? The Father of glory. Wow. Did you ever think of him like that? In your prayer time, did you ever say, Father of glory? Fall on you now. Listen. The word glory itself is Kedish. It means heaviness. The Father of glory may give you to you spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of the calling, of his calling, and what, listen to this, this is so deep. What are the riches of the glory of this inheritance in the saints? Wow. Wow. You know, sometimes when our mamas and daddies pass away, they don't really leave us inheritance. Like my parents, in the natural, you know, we didn't have inheritance. But there is for all of us who love him, the riches of the glory of his inheritance. So his amazing love for you. And I just pray you can feel it tonight. You know, if you're going to name something glory, you want glory, don't you? I mean, it's like, all right, give me that. How many are hungry for that? Yeah, God comes where there's hungry hearts. The Father of glory. Wow. Wow. Then it goes on and says, What is the exceeding greatness of his power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? Where? Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things, not some things, under his feet and gave him over all things in the church, which is his body. That is to us, beloved. The richness. <laughs> Darling, you're already rich. You just don't know it yet. And where are we? We are seated with him. Father of glory.
God wants us to root and ground ourselves together in covenant love. He wants us to wash the windows of our soul so that nothing hinders his life from going forth. He wants us to empty ourselves of all our agendas because the emptier we are, the brighter he shines. I want to talk about today about these hidden intercessors in our nation. I'm going to talk about the story from slavery to freedom of how intercessory prayer, warfare prayer, has sh- not only brought transformation and awakening, but it brought reformation to a whole nation. And I want to talk about some of the unsung heroes of that. All right. And so now when you hear this, do not disconnect. I'm talking about some of the, uh, not just some of the, the African-American intercessors but who were there at that time. Also talk about some of these powerful great awakeners at that time period too. It's not about the color, it's about our inheritance. See, because as believers, guess what? I have a Scottish inheritance. I have, a, I, have a, I have an Irish inheritance. Why? Because I'm a believer. First Peter 2 9 says, We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God's own possession, who proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. The word where it says that we are a chosen race, the word race is the word genos, is where we get the word genes. Not like the ones you wear, but talking about DNA. Jesus used that word in Revelation 22 to say he was the offspring of David. And then later on, it says we're, we're a holy nation. The word nation there is where ethnos, where we get the word ethnicity. In other words, as offspring of Father God, we're on racial identity as believers. So in other words, before I'm an African-American, I'm first and foremost a Christian in America. Before you're an Italian-American, if you believe you're, you're first and foremost a Christian in America. Now, so when we come together, that kind of unity, that kind of agreement, something powerful can happen. Right? So there's this intercessory inheritance that I want us all to tap into. And I'm going to show you how basically that, the, tapping into that inheritance has propelled me into what we're doing right now, this amazing story. So if I was going to call this... Uh, Anything. I mean, the title is Embracing Our Intercessory Inheritance from Slavery to Freedom. But uh, if I was really going to title it what I'd like to title it, I would title it Don't You Remember? Don't You Remember? So if you go to the next slide for me. So Joshua chapter 4, this powerful verse of scripture talking about the memorial stones that, that were there in Joshua's day. It's, uh, uh, just a brief backdrop to that story. So there's this whole generation that had. Grown up in the wilderness, they had clothes that never wore out, shoes that never wore out. They ate little cakey white stuff every day that came down from heaven. In other words, the supernatural was just normal for them. They were basically living off of the sacrifices of everybody else who had gone before them. And so they get to this place called the Jordan River, and the Lord says, you know what, I'm going to do for them. I'm going to do for them what they all read about, but they've never seen. I'm going to part the Jordan River the same way I parted the Red Sea. So the Lord does that. There's only two people from that previous generation who saw that, Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else is gone, except the, the, those descendants. So the Lord parts the Jordan River the same way he parted the Red Sea. Then he says, ah, oh, I should have had a V8. <laughs> so all the baby boomers got that joke. The, the millennials, not so much. They don't run that commercial anymore. <laughs> I should have had a V8. There's a generation after them who hadn't seen the Red Sea part of the, won't see the Jordan River part as well. So here's what you do. While the Jordan River is parted, I want you to grab 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan River, one from each tribe. And these stones were so huge. They weren't little rocks and boulders. They were so big, they had to carry them on their shoulders. Pile them up on either side of the Jordan, even in the middle of the Jordan River. And it says, let this be a sign among you. So that when your children ask later on, saying, what do these stones mean to you? You should tell your sons and daughters, listen, you didn't cross this Jordan River uh, and you didn't grab these stones out of the middle of the Jordan River because you had scuba gear that hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> no, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground, and this is the proof. Because the same God apart of slavery, the same God apart of the Red Sea, the same God apart of the Jordan River, and they'll part whatever circumstance for you. 